Hello and welcome to HappilyEducated.com. As I've mentioned in previous posts, the goal of my dissertation was to understand how social relationships influence musical development. And to do this, I compared the social networks of five young musicians using a qualitative form of social network analysis. Now, there's a lot of talk these days about social networks, uh, thanks to sites like Facebook and LinkedIn, but the term is used somewhat differently in academic contexts. And really, the field of social network analysis is huge and varied, and I probably should have taken an entire post to discuss the ins and outs of that before trying to explain how it relates to my dissertation. But since I didn't do that, I'm going to just quickly summarize here uh, what social networks are and why researchers care about them. So the term social network is used to refer to the composite structure of an individual's social relationships. Um, social network analysis is based on the premise that relationships and the patterns they form are the foundation of social life, or they create social life. And social network analysts map social connections to understand how resources flow from one network member or one person um, to another. Now, this, the resulting diagrams basically show how people are connected to each other. For example, who knows who and how close or distant their relationships are. And researchers are typically interested in both the content of these relationships and in the actual pattern or structure of these relationships. So although the term resource is used all over the place in social network uh, literature, it is rarely, if ever, defined. And since for my study I was struggling mightily to find a definition, I actually ended up contacting several prominent researchers to ask for their help or assistance. And many of them were kind enough to get back to me, and they pretty much confirmed my belief that no real definition or firm definition of the term resource exists. So, one researcher, though, uh, whose name I'm not really sure how to pronounce, but Alexandra Marin or Marin, something like that, she was kind enough to offer up her own definition, which was, quote, uh, if you forced me to define it right now, I would say it's something, tangible or not, useful that can pass from one person to another. Now, considering that some social network researchers uh, look at how diseases or self-destructive behaviors pass between people or flow between people in networks, I would say that maybe we should just scratch the word useful from that definition. But besides that, it seems to work quite well. Because social network researchers look at a huge variety of things and call them resources, such as, for example, material goods, um, services, information, attitudes, beliefs, values, social support, etc., etc., etc. Or in other words, resources can be almost anything, positive or not, that passes from person to person. Now, social networks are significant for human development because the experiences and learning opportunities that you have in life are largely dependent upon who you know. Uh, you know, and this is especially critical for children who most of the time don't have a ton of relationships and who cannot independently establish new relationships for themselves. So basically children, the people they know are their family, typically, and maybe some family friends, maybe some caregivers, but it's a pretty narrow social circle. And that means that they only have access to whatever resources those people have. And if the quality or quantity of those resources is somehow lacking, then that child's development could be hindered, possibly. To understand how musical development occurs, it's important to consider what musically significant resources a person has access to in his or her environment and how he or she uses those resources. So in my study, I identified a huge number of musically significant resources that the participants in my study had access to through their social connections. And these included things such as, of course, exposure to music, um, instruments and other musical equipment, access to those things, uh, support, encouragement, um, feedback on their musical behaviors, transportation to musical events, um, you know, concert tickets, website design in one case, um, what else? Practice or rehearsal space, career guidance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all sorts of things could fall under that umbrella of musically significant resources. 
And so some of these resources were tangible, some of them were not. Uh, some of them were directly musical, some of them were not. But for the most part, the participants in my study had access to ample resources which facilitated their development. However, in one case, um, a participant was struggling with having access to sufficient resources. Uh, specifically, he lacked the money to buy the musical equipment he needed, and he lacked information um, and social connections that would have helped him figure out how to make a career for himself in music and how to sort of promote himself musically. Now, his family and friends wanted to help him, and they tried to help him, but they didn't really have um, the information and money and social connections that he needed either. So, of course, people can only provide the resources that they themselves have. And the quality and type of resources people have depends in large measure on their past experiences and social interactions. So, in general, resources are finite. You know, some people have access to more resources than others, but unless, you know, perhaps you are a member of the 1%, um, you know, you only have access to limited resources in your life. And schools and arts organizations in particular often struggle with limited resources. Now, this opens up the very tri tricky ethical question of how resources should be distributed. Um, you know, if there's not enough resources available for everyone to have all that they could possibly want or need, then how do you go about divvying up what is available? And I have some thoughts about how this question might be answered, um, which I'll talk about in an upcoming post. But really, I don't think there probably is a perfect solution to this problem. Furthermore, um, according to my research anyhow, it's not just about having access to resources. Access isn't enough. For development to occur, a person has to actually use his or her resources. Uh, and this, again, I'll be talking about, uh, I think, in my next post. So, throughout the process of conducting this study, I had ample opportunity to consider, for me personally, what resources I have, what resources I need, what resources I want, um, what resources the people I know have that I could possibly access or use if I wanted to, and how I could use all of these resources to accomplish whatever my goals are. And, you know, I've been especially thinking about how my personal time, energy, and money are limited resources, which I should spend very carefully. And this may sound very morbid, but I've become very aware of the fact that I will not live forever. And so I want to use whatever time is remaining to me in, you know, the best way possible. And so this has led me to seriously consider what's important to me and what is not, what is sort of a waste of my time and energy. And I will be talking about this also in an upcoming post. Um, but for now, I'll just say that, you know, I've used more than my fair share of resources in my lifetime, and I think it's time for me to now um, help make sure that others have access to the resources they need as well. And so I will leave you with that for today. Thanks so much for watching, and until next time, happy learning.